And now, with sound investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, we've got a special presentation today. Chris Pedersen, our director of research, came out with what I thought is just a terrific article in the American Association of Individual Investors Journal. And I'm not the only one uh, who thought it was terrific because they chose to put the title of that article middle of the page in as big a letters as you could possibly get. And that title, it's long. I love it because I love I love titles that make me think that something's possible without breaking a leg. So double your, your lifetime purchasing power in 20 minutes. Double your lifetime purchasing power in 20 minutes. That's, that's a big statement. Uh, you know, I've used 101 decisions to change your financial future. Uh, the, the difference in my case is uh, I'm, I don't make any, uh, any claim that it's going to be better. I just hope it'll be better. But I think what's in this article, Chris, is, uh, is about a better future for a whole bunch of investors. So I know you've got some PowerPoints. Uh, I would love to see them. I'm going to try to be mostly a listener, but I've seen, I've seen the PowerPoints. I've got a few questions. I've read the article a couple times. It's one of those articles. There's so much in it that it, I think it takes a couple of reads to get everything from it. And we, by the way, are going to have a link to the AAII website where you will be able to get it. You know, you'll have to give them your email address, but We've tested this, and it turns out that when you click under journal, and then you'll see the October journal, and you well, we'll take you there with a link so that you all you'll have to do is type your name in your email address. So, Chris, get us get us started here. Tell us where where did this article come from, and um, and, and and really, are you serious? It's twenty minutes. <laughs> or is this just to get my attention? I I am serious. It's twenty minutes, and I wrote it. I I've I wrote it a year and a half ago, and it took oh. until this year actually to to finish it and publish it. And I wanted to publish it in the fall because I think that it really pertains to people who are doing open enrollment, especially if they have an employer provided four hundred one k program. And the gist of the story is that for somebody who invests in the defaults of the 401k program that are most typical across the industry, and they do that for 40 years of their career, and then they do fixed 4% withdrawals in retirement, and you look at all the cash flows in and the cash flows out and the standard investment, which is a target date fund, and then you adjust for inflation and you say, well, what was the impact on how much they have to spend over a lifetime? Mm -hmm. It doubles their spending power, even adjusting for inflation, just investing in a target date fund, which is kind of unbelievable. I, 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 when I first ran those numbers, I thought that's, that's just not possible. And so I wanted to explain the story and explain how people might even do a little bit better and um, I know that the article begs some questions and there's some opportunities for clarification. And yes, I do have some PowerPoints, but we'll try and use words here that uh, explain it for people on a podcast out for uh, a walk so that they can get value out of it uh, without that. So I'm going to start sharing this PowerPoint and um, let's, let's make this as interactive as we can because I think it'll be more fun. Um, and sometimes I go too fast anyway, so you can slow me down. <clears throat> so the title of the article was Double Your Lifetime Purchasing Power in 20 Minutes. And part of what powers this is what has happened to retirement portfolios over the last 20 years. Basically, um, because of target date funds, 
you, what you see is that in 2005, if you looked at the average investor in a 401k, they only had about 55% of their investment in equities and the rest was in fixed income. And we know that for a young investor, it makes sen sense that they can take more risk because they have more time for compounding to work for them and more time to work. But I think the truth is most 25 year olds signing up for a, a retirement plan aren't, they're not educated about investing. We don't do that very well in school. And so they, they want to be diversified and they look at all these choices and they say, well, I'll take a little of this and 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 I'll be diversified. <clears throat> and what they don't realize is that by holding a high percentage in bonds, that's going to reduce their long-term likelihood of success because it reduces their potential return substantially. So with the introduction of target date funds, people get defaulted into something that is more appropriate. And now what you see in 2021 is that the average uh, investor in a 401k has close to a 90% allocation to, uh, to equities. So it's dramatically changed. And what I wanted to see is, well, with, with this significant improvement in their expected return, it turns out this is like two to 3% across their accumulation years of expected return increase. What would their experience be? And so, um, I, I, I ran the numbers and to run the numbers, I had to make assumptions. And so the assumptions I made were I looked at well, what's the median salary in the United States at $68,000 a year. Well, if somebody took the typical default program that they would have in a 401k, it would start them out. It would default them to start saving at 3% of that salary, which is $2,040. Can I ask right there, Chris, about this? Median salary of sixty eight thousand. Yeah, that for a it, it looks very similar to a number I have seen for college graduates at age twenty five. Uh, uh -huh. Or is that what this is? Uh, I think it's the median U.S. household salary. So um, household. it's probably high for uh, a high school graduate, and uh, it it's probably typical for a college graduate. So um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I took the median household salary, which is probably more typical of mid-career. Um, I think the, since we're going to focus on purchasing power multipliers, mm -hmm. the actual dollar amount doesn't matter as much because if you, if you lowered these numbers all by a factor of two, the multipliers would stay the same. But uh, continuing on then, the default would be you'd start at 3% and you'd get a 50% employer match, which would be 1,020 for a total of $3,060 in year one. And the automatic default for most programs is that that contribution amount will increase by 1% per year. So you start with 3% in year one, then you go to 4% and 5% and 6%. And the match typically maxes out at $3,000 per year. So yeah, I've got a table here that shows how that plays out. But you start out in year one with a total contribution of $3,060. And then it ramps up till in year eight, you've got a total contribution of $9,800. And that $9,800 then stays constant until you retire, as long as you're working. Now, you have mentioned this several times now, that this is the most common uh, automatic 401k uh, combination of how much, um, where they put you, I guess, and how much they're going to put in. Did you actually see a, a number uh, of, of how many plans have this built in, uh, or, or is it just... It's just generally known that this is the most common default automatic 401k setting. I took this out of, there's a Vanguard report called How America Saves that mm -hmm. they publish. And I took this out of the most recent Vanguard report. And uh, so these were the, um, the most, most common. And I would say that this is probably about half of people who have an employer match 
401k plan would would see this sort of experience. Some people might see something a little bit better, a little bit worse. Some people won't have a default. Some people might have to make all these choices on their own. But I thought if I'm modeling something, I'll just pick pick the one that is the most common. Yeah. So what happens if you follow this plan? That's kind of the the next question. And uh, you 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 ask a question. I'm going to follow up on the next page with well well if if we didn't inflation adjust it, what does it look like? I wanted to look at the real purchasing power. I wanted to look at the inflation adjusted dollars, and I'll show you why in a second. But the reason I I wanted to look at the inflation adjusted dollars is that I want to know how much your purchasing power changes. So how much? Uh, do you get to buy with the money that's invested, not just how big did the account get? So we'll look at it both ways. But if we look in the working years at somebody who just is a spendthrift, they, they don't save anything. They basically have the dollars they made to spend. You get your dollars, you spend some of it on taxes. That is a spend. You spend it on taxes. It may not be a choice, but you spend it. And then you get the rest. So, so the baseline assumption would be you spend everything you made, and that would be a lifetime purchasing power uh, multiplier of one. You made a certain amount of money and you spent it all. So you got to you got a lifetime purchasing power of one. But if you look at somebody who saves this roughly 10% into a target date fund, so that's the top of this bar, and you look at how much it grows to in inflation adjusted purchasing power, it grows to more purchasing power than the total money that was made in the working years. And about half of it gets spent in retirement, about half of it gets passed on to heirs. And that's the median amount. So some people see a little more, some people see a little bit less. But that's an amazing, an amazing truth. Now, you ask the question, well, what would have happened if we just looked at this in nominal terms, just the account balances? So I did that. And, and you'll see why I don't want to look at these numbers this way. Basically, what it says is that the amount you get to spend in retirement and the amount you pass on to heirs, if you don't adjust for inflation, is about three times the total amount you made while you were working. Now, if I was looking at these numbers, I'd say, wow, you're oversaving. It's like, that's ridiculous. I don't have any need to have three times as much money in retirement as I had while I was working. But you will actually need three times as much money. <laughs> because there's going to be inflation. And so that's why I don't look at it without adjusting for inflation. And the difference in the in in the names for those two things, when we look at the dollars adjusted for inflation, that's a real return or a real balance. And when we look at it, uh, including the inflation, but I'm not adjusting it back to today's dollars, that's nominal returns or nominal balances. So I know this was important to you, Paul. Did we address the a question? I appreciate it. I think it's. I do think it's important people get that. Uh, by the way, those people who did not save, and there are a lot of them. I don't remember the the uh, the, the percentage, uh, and 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 other. There are reasons why people don't save, but they they basically are counting on Social Security, and there are a lot of people who survive with Social Security. That they're not going to have the kind of of lifestyle, money-wise, certainly that the people who save have, but but uh, no, I think that's uh, uh, that's terrific. Yeah, and I didn't include Social Security here, and it was one of the first comments somebody made on the article. And the biggest reason I didn't is it would be very complicated to figure it out because it depends a lot on how much you make. Uh, somebody who makes more money will be helped less by social security in retirement. Somebody who makes less money will be helped more by social security in retirement. Um, it will help everyone. Uh, it's, it's not that I don't appreciate the program. I think, I think it's a good program uh, to have a way to help increase the financial security of our older population. Uh, and, um, it's just, it would have made the analysis too complicated. Yeah. By the way, I have to, I have to, to note, if you think about what's a, 
what's going to happen in January, an 8% increase. Yeah. Social Security payments. How many people have ever had an 8% raise in their life? That is going to be a big deal. I know. I know the dollars don't buy as much as they used to, but it's it's going to it's going to feel good. Yeah, yeah. So I know this sounds too good to be true. And because of that, I did an analysis uh, where I showed in the article how much your contributions are for every decade and how much the investment return is for every decade. So if you look at ages 25 to 35, and by 35 here, I mean the first day of your 35th year, uh, and the first day of your 25th year. So um, we could have done 25 to 34. You made that comment. But uh, if we look at ages 25 to 35, uh, you make $71,500 in contributions with these assumptions and you get $23,500 in investment return. Not bad. Uh, if you look at ages 35 to 45, and these are all the median real numbers, you make $98,000 in contributions and you get $120,000 in return. That is kind of amazing. In, in only 20 years, you've gotten to where the return from the investments that you've made is exceeding your new contributions. Ages 45 to 55, still 98,000 in contributions and $300,000 in return. Ages 55 to 65, 98,000 in contributions and $435,000 in return. So by the time you're approaching retirement, your returns are greatly exceeding your contributions. And in fact, um, one of the milestones a lot of people reach in those later years is their returns start to exceed their income. The returns here, the median real return, approximately how much is that return and and let me make sure i understand you look you went all the way back to 1928 on building yes. this study so we got the we got the deflationary period in there from the 30s we've got the depression we've got whatever all those good and bad things that happened over the last 90 plus years what is that median real return uh, let me see. hold on a sec. I, I got to go to a resource. I'm going to pull up my book here, Two Funds for Life. Uh, two Funds for Life. <clears throat> and I can look at um, the appendix where I have the 1928 returns. And I can look at a target date fund. And I can tell you that across a lifetime, so this includes accumulation and withdrawal. Your expected median real return dollar weighted was about 5.6%. Mm. Okay. So in these years approaching retirement, it would be higher. It would be a little bit higher. It's probably, you know, 6 or 7%. And in the earlier years, it might be 7 or 8%. And in the later years, it's going to be, you know, lower. So, yeah. Okay, so 5.6 is the real what does that, and I realize again, it's it's the median number. What does that then convert to nominal? Because I've been nine point eight percent. Nine point eight. Nine point so, eight. Yeah, this was going back to nineteen twenty eight. Yep. So what I've been telling people, and I've been uh, giving them a number that's too low. I've been telling people that when you look at a lifetime of target date fund returns, this is during the accumulation period. It's about an 8% average return. What you're saying is it's closer, it's over nine. Well, keep in mind that that's, uh, that's a dollar weighted return uh, mm -hmm. across a lifetime with cash flow assumptions. So if you did a lump sum investment, you'd get a different answer. Um, and I'm not sure whether the number you were using was lump sum. And the other thing is, uh, you know, going back to 1928 versus 1970, you'd get different answers. So, um, and that's in the book. We could pull that out, but I don't think that's we need great. To thing. I'm sorry to take you off. The no, subject. that's okay. So the, uh, the next phase in the chart is, uh, retirement. And so from ages 65 to 75, 
uh, you are taking out five hundred thousand dollars roughly in with withdrawals, and you're getting about a six hundred and thirty five thousand dollar return. So in those early years, the target date fund is still a little bit more aggressive, the early years of retirement, enough so that the average retiree is going to see their nest egg grow, which is a great comfort, I think, for a retiree uh, in those first five years to be able to live off their investments and have a likelihood that it still grows. That gives them a lot of comfort. From 75 to 85 and 85 to 95, the investment returns and the withdrawals are approximately the same in the median real case. Yeah. And, and Chris, just to be sure, uh, I understand the the basis for all of this, you are using the Vanguard target date fund glide path, correct? I'm using that as uh, as an allocation and I'm modeling it as best I can, yes. Okay, I mean, obviously there was no S&P 500 in 1928. I mean, it's, right. you got to use a, a lot of hypothetical information to build these things. Right. But but it but from sixty five to seventy five, just to give a little perspective there, uh, where you're still making more money than you're taking out during that period of time. What do they go from about fifty percent equity down to thirty percent equity? Yes. But so by seventy five, it doesn't get any. They don't go any lower than than thirty percent no. equity. Okay. Okay, just to give it perspective. It actually, I think by 72, they get to the 30%. It's about seven years after retirement. Ah, okay. So the thought that thousands of dollars of contribution per year can amount to millions of dollars of benefit, it sounds unbelievable. But when you look at it decade by decade, looking at the real dollars and the financial returns, you can see how it plays out. And... Older investors, having lived through this, know that it's true. And it's kind of amazing, but it's true. Uh, it's very likely most people across their lives will make more nominal dollars for sure, and even real purchasing power dollars uh, from their investments than they do from their working, which it's just, it's an, um, kind of an astounding truth for most people. So um, the young investor details, I, I put them down on this chart. Uh, and then I figured out if you take the dollars you get in the, the real dollars you get in retirement and the real dollars you get uh, in legacy that you pass on, and you divide that by the real dollars that you made in your working years, what is your lifetime purchasing power multiplier? And so for the person who didn't save, the lifetime purchasing power multiplier is one. You, you get the purchasing power that you got the day you got your paycheck. For this typical 20 minute automatic sign up plan, the median lifetime purchasing power multiplier is two. The bad luck or 10th percentile lifetime purchasing power multiplier was one and a half. So there will be some people who don't double their money, but still one and a half is a lot better than, than one. And the best case scenario or the 90th percentile was 2.4. Now we can improve on this and that's what we'll talk about next um, because hey, target, hey, uh, target date funds have step. flaws, but uh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. I want people to know this is right out of the article so that yes, if this, this is right out of the article, want to see this, they can, uh, I, I'm trying to picture all of these 40 year periods that you looked at in the accumulation. And that means some times where inflation was, was almost non-existent and the time when inflation was really high. So yeah, we, we used every starting month going from 1928 through 2021. Yeah. So we, and when we run out of time, we loop back. So some of the scenarios start in say 2020 and then loop back to 1928. Uh, and, yeah. and we do that to avoid oversampling the middle years. Um, and uh, so it, it covered a lot of history. Yeah. yeah. Hundreds, hundreds of scenarios. Yeah. 
All right. I just, I, because, you know, the fact that these are all inflation adjusted. See, one of the things people may not know is there are periods the market didn't do very well, but inflation was low. And there were times the market did beautifully, but inflation was high. And what you've done is you've taken that that out of the formula and just shown what did you have in purchasing power, not how did you look in terms of the number you can put on a piece of paper. Yep, and we will and we will look later uh, at the impact of some changes that we can make on the safe withdrawal rates in retirement too. So. So this this what this got us to the point of looking at what could you do with the automatic target date fund. But the next question was, could we do better? Because we know the target date fund has a couple of things that we don't like. Um, the first is that the target date fund carries bonds in the early years, which makes it a little more conservative than it really needs to be. It probably costs the young investor about a half a percent per year to have that 10% allocation in bonds over the 40 year period. Uh, the other thing is that a target date fund is built of total market funds. And that means there's no meaningful exposure to the small or the value parts of the market. Now, before I go ahead, like how, how can that be? It owns the small and the value parts of the market. Well, the small part of the market it owns is offset by the large part of the market it owns. The value part of the market it owns is offset by the growth part of the market it owns. The only way you can get some meaningful diversification and potential higher returns from the premiums from those parts of the market is to have disproportionate or, or overweighted parts of those. So. Uh, we look at what would happen if you compensate for these shortcomings in a target date fund by adding some small cap value. Um, before we get to that, though, Paul, you asked again about nominal. So I did throw the nominal numbers what? on here. Great. And uh, again, if we went back and said, you know, I'm just going to go with this default scenario. How much uh, how much money would you make? starting with a salary of $68,000 and increasing with inflation across 40 years, you'd actually make $6.2 million, which is kind of staggering. And how much uh, would you save? Um, you would save with the, uh, the match from your employer $737,000 and your investment balance when you get to retirement would be $6.8 million. So somebody, who's making $68,000 a year would say, why do I need $6.8 million in retirement? That's just, I'm oversaving. And you'd spend $8.5 million in your retirement years, and you'd end up leaving $11.2 million to your heirs. And again, you're like, well, why would I leave $11 million to my heirs when I just started retirement with $6.8 million? But when we adjust it all for inflation, what you realize is that you basically end up with a end balance that's roughly equal to what you started with in the median case. And so that means you preserve this nest egg, it's real purchasing power and, and you can feel more confident about it as you go. Yeah, so. All right, so let's take a look at these ways we could improve. Um, here's the target date fund. And as I said, you know, we start out here with these 10% uh, allocation to bonds. This is the Vanguard target date, uh, target retirement glide path. And that's what we're going to try and compensate for. And then you can see it's made up of basically total market funds in these early years. The, um, so we've got the, um, the total international market and the total US market um, are, are what it's made up for. So no meaningful allocation to small in value. And so we, way, we ask how we can compensate for that. Yeah, and Chris, just for the people listening, uh, the red area is the U.S. equity and the yellow yep. area, or gold area, whatever it is, is international. It's about 70% of the equity is typically U.S. and about 30% of the equity is, is in international. So uh, this to give some some perspective to that. Yep, that's right. 
and and people on the podcast won't see this so i'll just comment on it um uh, people who observe this closely will notice that as you approach retirement as you said earlier paul you uh at retirement, you're at a 50% allocation to equities. And about seven years later, you're at about a 30% allocation to equities. And not only do you shift towards bonds, but um, approaching retirement, they start to bring in treasury inflation protected bonds and even some cash to uh, just make make it all less volatile and more conservative. Uh, and for investors who get into retirement and are comfortable with it and start to feel confident they're going to do okay, they may choose to be less conservative this, than this. They might decide to either choose a target date fund with a different date because mm -hmm. that would make them more aggressive if they choose a later date or to hold additional small cap value or to hold additional equity funds. There's a lot of ways they could adjust. So if we're going to compensate here with small cap value, uh, maybe investors won't have access to that in their 401k. So to make it easy, what we'll do is we'll think about two ways to do it where you could add that small cap value in a second fund. And basically the gist of it is we won't require any rebalancing. We'll just say that maybe they open an IRA outside of their their employer savings program and they put some portion of their retirement savings into a u.s small cap value fund now um, for somebody with a 401k who has access to a small cap value fund it's even easier they just change the default contributions and they can automate these plans as well and again, to keep it simple, we've asked that people save 10 pennies out of every dollar in their retirement savings, 10%. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, take one of those pennies and put it into the US small cap value. And, and that'll be the 90-10 strategy here. So nine pennies go into the target date fund, one penny goes into the small cap value fund out of every dollar you make. We'll also look at an 80-20 strategy where you take eight pennies and you put them into the target date fund and two pennies and you put them into the small cap value fund. What happens to the lifetime purchasing power multipliers using all of the same assumptions we used before? Well, now the median, remember it was about a factor of two multiplier for the target date fund. For the 90-10, it goes to two and a half. The 80-20 goes to 3.3. So the median, that means 50% of people have better and 50% of people have worse experience. The median experience for just taking two pennies and putting them in the small cap value fund went from a two times lifetime purchasing power multiplier to over a three times lifetime purchasing power multiplier. And the bad luck scenarios all got better as well. So the bad luck scenario for the target date fund was 1.5 times. The 90-10 is 1.7 times. And the 80-20 um, is 2.0 times. So even in the bad luck scenario for the 80-20, you get to double your lifetime spending power, which is, that, that, that that's nice. It's nice to think you might be able to count on it. Chris, the, this... Good luck and bad luck. Uh, let's just talk about the bad luck uh, here. And do you have any memory in looking at the numbers at what kind of part of the, of the, of the history uh, drove the bad luck? I, I don't. Um, I, it's in my book. <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, I, I do know this. I, I know that that one of the worst 40 years started in 19, I think, uh, uh, 29. Uh, and I think one of the best 40 years started in 1932. So it is, there is so much luck. Uh, well, in this process. The answer, the answer would also be different whether you're and it, whether you're at the beginning of your career starting accumulation or you're at the beginning of retirement. So for somebody starting accumulation, 1928 was probably a great time. 
Yeah. Right. Starting their career, even because that means that the market crash happened when they had no money and they started accumulating wealth when everything was cheap. Yeah. And and so across their lifetime, it probably played out great. A retiree starting in 1928 gets a double whammy. Their investments all get crushed by the market decline. And then they see, um, you know, the, uh, the, the declining withdrawals that they're going to have to live through because of the, um, the opposite of inflation happening for those first years. Yeah. Mm, thanks. Inflation. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think this, it's hard for me to see how somebody would have not benefited by one of these strategies. I, I think, uh, the only way it could really hurt you is if you are a market timer and you decide to pursue the 90-10 or the 80-20 and five years in, you give up on the strategy. I think that's really the, the underlying theme for anybody who decides to invest differently is that you really need to stick with it. You should pick something you can live with, you can stick with, you can invest with conviction because the way you get these premiums is by sticking with these assets through the years when they don't perform. And an earlier study you did indicated that there is no 20 year period that small cap value underperformed. That's right. The total market. But 20 years is a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very long time. One of the things I help, I, I think that helps a young investor though, is that because of the cash flows, it's really hard for them to know exactly what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's actually a good thing. Uh, you've said before that a, lo a lot of times a young investor won't know how bad the market is, is down because they're seeing these new contributions come in and, and pull it up. Yeah. All right. So, uh, I know that in the AAII and also in our podcast audience, not everybody is a young investor. So I wanted to look at what would happen if you took somebody who was age 50 and had never saved a penny. Uh, can we save them? <laughs> and and I, I went super aggressive and I said, this is somebody who at age 50 gets religion. And they decide that they're going to maximize what they can with their catch-up contributions and everything. And they're going to invest $26,000 a year, including the employer match. So the assumption of a $68,000 salary and a $26,000 a year savings rate for somebody who hasn't saved at all to this point, I'm sure is not realistic. But I still wanted to know if they got religion and they decided to do everything in their power, would it make the difference? Would it, would it catch them up? And so uh, I modeled this for somebody who retires at age 70. They even work a little bit longer. So instead of retiring at age 65, uh, they retire at age 70. And then they have 25 years instead of 30 years of retirement um, at a 4% withdrawal rate. And this late start investor doesn't see lifetime purchasing power multipliers that are nearly as big. And they also don't see uh, median withdrawals that are as high. The median withdrawals for the previous scenario were about uh, $48,000 a year. That was the inflation adjusted amount. Uh, this late start investor only sees withdrawals of $36,000 a year using that 4% assumption. Uh, so that might be a little bit tight. It, it, it might be tough for somebody and their lifetime purchasing power multiplier is only one and a half times. Now that's still a lot better than not saving and not starting at the age of 50. Uh, but it's, it's not nearly as good. And the reason is there just aren't as many years for the compounding to work for them or as many dollars for the compounding to work on. So, I think the strategy still helps. Now, if we look at what happens for somebody who is a late starter, who does that 90-10 strategy and puts 10% in small cap value, they increase their median real retirement spend dollars to 39,000 from 36,000, so that's good. And their median lifetime purchasing power multiplier went up to 1.6. And for somebody who did the 80-20, they almost get up to that two times multiplier 
they're at 1.9 and their uh, median real retirement spending dollars went to 41,000. So again, it's just really hard to make up the difference when you start late, but it's a heck of a lot better to start late and do this than to start late and then just rely on social security or, or charity. Yeah. Did you have any questions on this one, Paul, or anything that I went over too fast? No, you know, it is, I, I think of all the people I was, I can't think of all of them, but many people I spoke with who were in this predicament. And it is, it is so tough because when, when, when you haven't been an investor for all of those years, uh, the first thing that happens is you tend to get excited about it when the market is up, mm -hmm. not when the market is down. Yep. And what they need to do is to be excited about when it, the market is down. Uh, so there's, there's certainly a lot of luck in this process. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and of course the, the other thing that we don't know is that during that period of time, that they do in late in starting late, that they do put money away. They do it during a period of time that 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 uh, inflation is low. They could that could happen. Then they retire, and inflation goes up. Uh, they've got a serious that's, again. Luck is a big part of what your life is going to be like, and the later you wait to start the more luck plays a, a bigger and bigger part. Well, and luck also plays a role in our education as investors. Uh, you know, there's people who invest in the stock market and six months later are down 30% and sell and then say, I'm never investing in the stock market again. Uh, it can, luck can teach us the wrong lessons. And, uh, you know, that that's tough too yeah well let's uh let's try and end on a more positive note so i i i decided to look at uh somebody who has been a lifetime investor in a target date fund so they've just followed this simple path and they've gotten to retirement and then they they consider these options in retirement. Like, would it make sense to invest 10% in small cap value or 20% in small cap value? Would it help them? And I also looked at, uh, I look at these with withdrawals that I call nudge withdrawals. Just to keep it really simple, I, I have the investor take their 4% annual withdrawals increasing with inflation out of whichever fund is too big. So uh, these strategies are pretty simple, like the 90-10, you expect to have 10% in the small cap value fund and 90% in the target date fund. Well, if the target date fund is 91%, when you go to take your withdrawal, you just take the 4% out of the target date fund and you let the small cap value ride. And then a year later, maybe the target date fund is 12% instead of it's 10. Well, you just take the 4% out of that. And over time, it just keeps nudging these back to the right, the right uh, allocation. If somebody wanted to do annual rebalancing, I analyzed that in my book. It's not that much of a difference, but I just wanted to keep it simple here. And what we see is that for somebody who just sticks with the target date fund in retirement, between when they retire and when they die, if you take all of the money that they spend, the real dollars they spend and the real money they leave to heirs, they still double their money within the retirement years, which is kind of amazing. Um, and if you do the 90-10, you get instead of a 2.3 multiplier for the target date fund, you get a 2.4 and for the 80-20, you get a 2.9. So, so it helps. Um, but I think the more important thing for a retiree is what does it do to the safe withdrawal rate? The target date fund in retirement, because it's so conservative, has a safe withdrawal rate of about 3.7%. This is going all the way back to 1928. The 90-10 strategy. Can you define the safe? What is the safe withdrawal rate? The safe withdrawal rate is the amount of money you could take out 
uh, starting in year one and increasing with inflation every year and not run out of money. So the safe withdrawal rate is based on the worst case scenario. What that says is that there was one time somewhere along the way between 1928 and the end of all the scenarios we analyzed where if you calculated 3.7% of your nest egg in year one and started taking that as a withdrawal, increasing with inflation every year, you ran out of money. Mm. There was one time. It's the worst case. Um, so 3.7% is like right at the line. And what that means is that uh, 3.69, you didn't run out of money. 3.71, you did run out of money. Um, so it's it's right at the line. And th like I said, the 90-10, your safe withdrawal rate for 30 years is 4%. And the 80-20, the safe withdrawal rate was 4.4%. And they all had very high survival rates, 99% uh, plus. So I, I think of the safe withdrawal rate as um, a measure of resilience to sequence of returns risk. I think uh, Daryl was the first person to draw that that observation, and I agree with him. And I think the 80-20 allocation with a higher safe withdrawal rate is particularly interesting for somebody who may have undersaved because they they may find along the way that they have to take out more than 4% uh, occasionally, and, and they're less likely to run out of money with that 80-20 allocation than they are with 100% target date fund. So, so what else, Chris, can we do to uh, to increase this this final number, the, uh, the whatever the multiplier is, or however much we take out or leave, what are some simple steps uh, on uh, beyond this average, most common three percent, and then going up at one percent a year for seven years? What are the steps you would have people look at? Well, I'm I, I'm not sure when that question will come up, but I, I I think you're right; it will come up. I think a lot of investors, uh, especially people approaching retirement and then in their first few years of retirement, it's it's been described as a red zone. It's it's a high high uh, stress period of time when you're wondering where the money's going to come from and how it's going to work out. But I think as people get confident that they are able to live off their retirement and they are confident in the returns they're getting and they want to take more risk there are several things they could do one thing you could do is uh, let's say um, you retire in 2040 and you're in the 2040 target date fund and you start to feel like the allocation is too conservative for you yeah what somebody would do if they wanted to switch the date and switch to a higher equity allocation is they would choose a later date. So they would go from the 2040 to the 2045 fund or to the 2050 fund. Um, you could uh, choose to replace some of the allocation that you have to the target date fund with a total market fund. Uh, so there's a lot of different choices. Um, you could choose to manage your bond allocation on your own and just replace the target date fund with a total market fund and a total bond fund a uh, lot of a lot of different ways that people can go and and i believe as people do enter retirement and they get through that red zone and they become comfortable with it they'll they'll start to figure it out and they'll decide that they do want to do something different and that's fine yeah and for the first time investor i i really think if they'll this is about getting an education and then having the discipline to do it, that the payoff for investing in the individual funds, which at Vanguard, you can, you can own the same funds, which could include a small cap value fund as well uh, in, in some retirement 401k plans. And a lot of 401k plans have a self-directed feature where you can you can get access to a whole bunch more mutual funds uh, and self-direct where you could possibly pick up a small cap value. But the idea would be, and Chris, you said it, that 10% uh, fixed income that's from age, let's say 20 to 40 at Vanguard, 
you get rid of that bond for the first 20 years. You don't need a bond. In fact, bonds hurt your return more than likely uh, over the first 20 years. And then at age 40, if you want to move that money then into a target date fund, you can do that. But I think you'll be way ahead if you get rid of those bonds. Now, I also think that if you do this from age 20 to 40, guess what? You've gotten an education. And it may be that you will be able to address the glide path on your own and have a, a mix of, of equity asset classes that will serve you better for the rest of your life. So uh, I, there, there, there are some relatively easy things that people could do to do better. But I think just these basics that you've presented are pretty doggone powerful, Chris. And, and I, I know when I say thank you to you for all this work that, that you do, and, and it is all on a volunteer basis, I know how many people are appreciative uh, of that. And here's just one more example. So uh, on behalf of all those folks out there, thank you very much for having having done this. And your book is available at Amazon. And we don't give it away. You People have to pay. It's like $18 or do you remember what it is, Chris? I wanted to say it was in 1999 uh, okay. or something okay. close to that. I'll double check it while we're talking here. And every penny that would have gone to Chris, if he wasn't a good guy, is being given to the foundation. So uh, when you buy his book, you are actually helping the foundation uh, further it, its its goals. So uh, yeah, the book is $9.95 in the Kindle copy and $19.95 in the um, paper copy. And uh, all the proceeds go to the foundation. And uh, I don't know. Someday maybe we'll figure out a way to do a promotional giveaway, Paul, right? That'd be great. I love yeah, it. I think, I think that would be fun <laughs> to uh, let people, even if it was just for a limited time, uh, get the PDF for free. That would be awesome. That's great. Well, Chris, thanks. And uh, we will uh, uh, be back. By the way, I, we will have that link to the article for people who want to see these tables that uh, Chris has just shared. Uh, uh, on paper, and and by the way, you can you can try a um, for one month. I think at AAII for two bucks, you can join and see what they've got. And I will tell you, if you did nothing more than read the rest of the articles that Chris has done there at AAII, I think you'd find them helpful. We've done, my, my Rich Buck and I have done a number of articles there, and, um, and I, I really respect their attempt to educate investors, uh, uh, although they get into some areas that we don't, like individual stocks uh, and that type of thing. But, but generally, there's some great planning information, great asset allocation information. Um, we have lots of friends like Craig Israelson. Uh, writes there very often. Terrific, terrific work. So, all right, thanks. And we'll see you soon. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.